Okay, thank you. Uh, how are you guys doing tonight? Any uh, DeFi DGens in the house today? No? All right. Uh, decentralized finance, what is it? You hear this term a lot. What does it really mean? Right? It's used very broadly, but it actually refers to the, sorry, actually refers to the applications that are built on blockchain. So when you're talking about DEXs or lending protocols, it's the specific applications being used on, on the platform layers. The DeFi market, it's typically measured in terms of TVL or total value locked. So what happened in 2020 was that the industry just exploded as a result of yield farming. You had a mark, uh, TVL of about $100 million at the time, beginning of January. And then suddenly, two years later, the, the market's at $180 billion. So this is just phenomenal growth. And it was really driven by a lot of crazy new products and projects that launched. DeFi summer. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of this term. It's really started in June, July of 2020. It started with a comp token. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Compound, the lending protocol. So these guys, basically what they did was they allowed you, oh, there we go. They allowed you to pool money onto these protocols and earn interest or to borrow funds on these protocols. And typically what you saw was very low interest rates. So you could borrow money really cheaply. You deposit your collateral, you you'd pay uh, very low interest rates. And it seemed like a good idea at the time. It didn't really take off in the beginning until Compound launched its governance token, Comp token. And this is where yield farming started. It all stemmed from here. The Comp token was listed on Uniswap at $95. I have no idea why. Right? Where, where do you get that valuation from? It was $95. Went up to $250 in the first month. Okay. So what this did was it made lending and borrowing really profitable through this governance token. Okay, so this kicked off like everything that went crazy that summer. Uniswap launched their token. All these DeFi protocols launched their token. Thousands of DeFi projects launched with a governance token. Oops. Uh, and then the most infamous project in DeFi, Olympus. I bought a lot of this stuff, right? I bought a ton of this stuff, honestly. This project came out in uh, March 2021, advertising APYs of 200,000%. Like, you look at this and you say, okay, this is a scam, but you buy it anyway, right? Because you're like, you're curious about this. Like, is this really going to pay out 200,000%? What the hell is continuous compounding, right? Rebasing. You didn't understand what any of this meant, but you didn't care. You looked at the numbers and you bought some of it. By one year later, this thing, it, you know, it's 200,000% APY. A year later, it's down to 7%. Token price, or the APY and the token price is down 99.99%. The meme, you know, the meme that uh, Olympus started and started trending on the, uh, all, you know, everywhere was 3,3, which referred to game theory, right? 3,3, now there's a something, comma, something everywhere. Everybody's doing this now. It all started from Olympus. A three comma three quickly became Ponzi comma Ponzi. So what's the problem in DeFi really? Like you look at the industry, it grew really rapidly, really, it was a really exciting time for about two years, but why did it all come crashing down? And no one really knows, but you know, there's some smart people at Blockworks that put out some research on DeFi and DeFi 2.0. And really, you have to look at these projects and their governance token and whether or not they actually have any value, right? So these governance tokens were launched. They started farming this out to users, like 100, 200% APY, started dumping this stuff out for free. But what are these protocols actually earning and what are they holding in their treasuries? So if you take a look, these are the top 10 DeFi protocols. Aave, Balancer, Compound, Curve, etc. If you look at their treasuries, you can think of it as their bank accounts, right? What are they holding in their bank accounts? They're holding their own tokens. It's like a company with a stock that has no money, 
What is that stock worth? Nothing, right? That's exactly what's going on with DeFi. And this is one of the most fundamental problems within DeFi. So who is earning money right now? If you look, this is a uh, data taken from Token Terminal. You'll notice it's mostly DeFi apps. There's OpenSea, of course, and blockchains, Ethereum, Binance, uh, even Bitcoin is up there. So it's primarily DeFi apps that are actually generating revenues. But the problem is that they're taking these revenues and fees and they're just handing them all out in the form of governance tokens. Or they're doing a buy, uh, a, a buy and burn. DeFi yields today, what are people looking for? Uh, they're looking for stable yields. So they're sticking with blue chips like Bitcoin and Ethereum or putting money into stable coins and they're settling for 5% yields now. So these are the top 10 projects on uh, DeFi Lama. And you can see most of the pools and most of the staking taking place now is in very, very stable and safe assets. So DeFi 1.0, what was it really about? And that's you know everything that I talked about today, yield farming, governance tokens with no value, uh, treasury, treasuries that didn't retain any value. Uh, one of the big problems on DeFi 1.0 was also gas fees. I don't know if you guys played around with staking and all this stuff during the time, 2021. I staked on my own app um, in November, 2021. And to stake my own tokens on my app costed me $500, right? That was $500 transaction fee. It's crazy. So we switched to Arbitrum Layer 2. Um, money Lego is a term that came out of DeFi as well, Money Lego. That's essentially you take curve tokens, stake curve tokens, you throw it on another protocol, turn those protocols tokens, then you take those, that protocol's tokens, put it on another app, and earn another governance token. That's Money Lego. You're basically just taking projects and deriving value from other projects. Problem is, is there any real value being created through any of this? Nobody's really paying attention to any of that. They're just looking at the numbers and saying, oh, I'm earning money. But you're not earning money because the industry is down 75%. So you're actually down money. DeFi protocols, just like the Fed, were printing money. You know that meme that was going around, burr, burr, you know, the money printing, same thing was going on with DeFi. That, that's the irony of this entire industry. So for DeFi 2.0 and what's coming in the future, how is this going to look different? Layer 2 networks, as I said earlier, were deployed on Arbitrum, which is an optimistic rollup. There's also zero knowledge uh, rollups and optimism, um, you know, Polygon and other you know, layer two networks that are going to really save on fees and help with transactions and help the industry grow. Uh, DEXs will, will go mainstream. Uh, if you look at what's happened recently with FTX, Three Arrows Capital, um, what else is there? Um, Genesis, you know, these are centralized organizations that are supposed to be handling cryptocurrency, which is not really what's supposed to be happening, right? You're not supposed to be putting your money with centralized exchanges. So DEXs like Uniswap and Curve, I think, will really start to grow as people don't trust their money with centralized institutions anymore. And really, the growth area for DeFi is in areas like derivatives exchanges. You've seen phenomenal growth with projects like um, GMX, right? GMX is on Arbitrum. It launched an avalanche recently. Phenomenal growth. Uh, they've got brilliant token e economics and they're handing over profits directly to their their users and also liquid staking if you look at projects like lido right it's one of the hottest projects right now in terms of tvl they've number one on the DeFi charts they essentially just liquid staking they stake ethereum for you and then you could take that token and you could transfer it out you could borrow against it you could trade it you could do whatever you'd like with it um, Another thing about DeFi and uh, the industry, right now, two years ago, you know, the interest rates in the US were around 1%. So you put your money in the bank, you'd earn about 1% on it. With inflation, you're earning negative at that time. Interest rates have gone shot way up and the money's moved out of crypto and DeFi now. So people are moving their money out of stable coins, putting them in the bank. 
So for DeFi in the next run, these interest rates or these yields have to go a lot higher, like way above 5%, 15, 20% yields. Like really, why are you buying crypto to earn 5% a year? That makes absolutely, that makes no sense. Uh, also for DeFi, you can't ignore Web3 and what's going on in the metaverse. So I think what's going to be really interesting in the future is to see how NFTs, play to earn, gaming, and all of these things really tie into DeFi to the things like uh, exchanges and lending. Uh, my forecast on the industry, something that I came up with. So I'm likening the crypto market and the DeFi market to the global equities and the global fixed income uh, markets. Okay. So if you look, roughly equities and fixed income are roughly about the same size, $125 trillion. Relative to that, the crypto and DeFi markets are really, really small, right? But if you look at 2021 at the peak, the crypto market was about $2.8 trillion in market cap. DeFi, roughly $185 billion at the peak. So DeFi only represents about 6% of the entire total crypto market cap. Whereas fixed income and equities is roughly the same. So you see a lot more upside potential with DeFi. 2024, 20, 25, my estimate is roughly about 10 trillion for the total crypto market. And for DeFi, 2 trillion. So that's up about 50x. Okay. Quick thing on BrinkFi and what we're doing. So I outlined a number of the problems really in the DeFi industry. And a lot of them focus around value, intrinsic value, real value, retaining earnings, right? So what, it, what does Brink do? It's a decentralized deal protocol with intrinsic value. So what does that mean? The protocol itself has to actually generate real value, charging fees, charging revenues, earning revenues, and retaining those revenues and earnings. So what we have is a token supply, the Brink token. It's minted and burned according to a bonding curve using smart contracts. So unlike something like a tether, where you've got a company minting this stuff, owning bank accounts, and this being very un, you know opaque, Brink is all on chain. It's all on Arbitrum. It's all on smart contracts. Everything's held in wallets. So Brink, the protocol, what it does is it charges mint and burn fees. It, it charges very high fees. Uh, those fees go into our treasury. And what we do with this treasury is we actually invest it into DeFi apps, liquidity pools, lending pools, whatever, whatever we see as you know, the highest reward to risk ratio. We have a second token called the GBRC or a governance token, and that's used strictly to govern the protocol and is used to incentivize usage of our, of our app. Uh, just, some, just some highlights. We were deployed to Arbitrum February of last year. Uh, our token holders increased 175x since September. Twitter followers are up 5x since December. We launched uh, Web3 campaigns with Galaxy um, in December. And Starting last year, late last year, the Brink token price and yield tracking uh, began on CoinMarketCap, Coinbase, and all of these other sites. And in the second half of 2023, we're preparing our yield vaults, which we think will be really exciting, which will essentially allow users to passively earn interest by depositing funds into our vaults and earning. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, such a great recap of what's going on uh, in DeFi. I think it's really a miracle what has happened in DeFi. I remember 2019, just Uniswap version one and a few more ugly, from the user perspective, ugly apps. And now so many uh, yield farming models, so many uh, uh, decentralized applications. It's, I think it's great what's going on. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, I think it's time to ask Luke.
Thank you. Uh, could you please explain a little bit more in detail how your protocol works? I, I didn't get it, how, how you can make money. Uh, sure, okay. So essentially uh, you can come into our app and you can mint the Brink token. Okay? So minting has an actual minting fee and vice versa when you unmint or you sell or burn the token, there's a fee associated with that as well. And that's essentially the basis. It's like taking Tether, putting it on chain, and uh, Tether charging fees. And that's that's how it works. What we wanted to do is create a, a different type of stable coin, one that's not pegged to the US dollar, and one that's actually decentralized and transparent. So the fees, just like Tether um, or Circle or any other stable coin, generated through minting and burning or the the minting and burning, and then the investment of the collateral and the treasury. You look more confused oh, now. Okay, so, so I, I think I, I did it more than before, but you were showing the people were able to make 175% yield, which basically means... Oh, no, no. That was... Uh... No, we had 175 uh, more, more people in holders, okay. token holders. Can you share how much they could earn? Because you were saying, or it's just stable coin. Not, nothing more. The yeah, people so, so the BRC token is a, is a stable coin. The protocols generating revenues. And unlike other projects, we don't take our money, just dish it all out, paid out as dividends or whatever. We actually retain it and we're reinvesting the funds. Okay, thank you. I have a, another sure. question. Yeah. Uh, I saw the treasury mint and bond and make a revenue. Could you please uh, explain how the treasury decide how how many to meet and burn yeah fortunately we're a very small team and very small projects so that's governance is not really a big issue at this point so really the team members will um put you know decide on okay where should we invest our money we'll decide amongst ourselves we'll, we'll put it into their discord community and announce it and actually throw up a little poll in the community to allow them to to vote on uh, certain so issues. For now, how many members engage for the making decision together? Uh, 20, 30. 20. Yeah, yeah, very small. Thank you. <laughs> okay, one more time. Thank you, Luke. Yeah.